Hello, welcome to yet another session of our NPTEL on nonlinear and adaptive control. This is Srikant Sukumar from Systems and Control, IIT Bombay. As always, we are in front of this very nice background, this Mars rover. And what we learn in this course are the sort of algorithms that uh, drive systems like this autonomously uh, without communication to any earth station on Mars and the moon. So um, let's go forward with what we have been doing in this course until now. Right? So uh, we had started off with uh, talking about the Babalat's lemma and um, its corollary last time. Right, so we had uh, sort of discussed the corollary to the Babalat's lemma, and in order to um, motivate how to use this Babalat's lemma, we had started by discussing a standard spring mass damper system. We, of course, you know, wrote the dynamics of the system, created error states corresponding to reference trajectories. Uh, wrote everything in, wrote the error dynamics in state space form, right? So we, yeah, wrote the error dynamics in the state space form. Then uh, we created this target system that we wanted to achieve, and we did that by choosing a very specific feedback controller. Um, it was, of course, evident to us by standard, uh, you know, linear systems methods that this is a exponentially stable system. However, we want to prove the same using energy functionals like these because this is what will eventually help us when this, the target systems turn out to be nonlinear. And of course, also in adaptive control cases. So what we did with Babla's lemma was only to, to prove asymptotic convergence. So we cannot say anything about transient performance. Bad things could happen in the transients, but we are only using the Babla's lemma to claim that for large time, the errors converge to zero. So we did a few steps. So we took the derivative of the uh, candidate uh, potential function, and we found that the derivative was less than or equal to zero, while the potential function was greater than or equal to zero. And using this, we started our signal chasing analysis. Right? And we did a few steps. The first step was to show that uh, V infinity, that is the limit as t goes to infinity vt exists and is finite. Then the second step was to show that all the closed loop signals, that is e1 and e2 in this case, were bounded. And the third and a rather critical step was to show that the signal e2 is in fact an L2 signal. Yeah, very quickly recapping this last point, because this is a very important point. Uh, how we did this was we integrated both sides of this v dot and it was possible to integrate the left hand side only because we know that limit as t goes to infinity v t is finite that is v infinity is a finite quantity and since we can do that uh, we have this right hand side which is essentially the um, integral of e2 squared and we also want to remind ourselves that the two norm of E2 looks something like an equation 313. Yeah, and, it, and we see that this is very similar to what we have here. And therefore, what we have is V infinity minus V0 is just the square of the two norm of E2 multiplied by a gate k2. Right. And so from this we can compute what is the two norm exactly. And this turns out to be finite and real because of the uh, fact that v infinity is finite and v is non-increasing, right? And this is essentially what is the definition of a signal to be in L2, that it's L2 norm v finite, okay? So, excellent. So, this is where we were until last time. And so, today we start off with our lecture number 
4. So we are we are on lecture four of the week two. Okay, we are on lecture four of week two. All right. So <clears throat> what do we have here? So uh, the next step is to prove that the derivative of e two is l infinity. Okay, that is it is bounded. Yeah. So we want to prove that the derivative of e two is bounded. Why do we want to do that? Well, I mean, if you all remember the statement of the Babalat's lemma and the corollary, you would remember that if a derivative of the function is e, is bounded or L infinity, then we can claim that the function itself is uniformly continuous. And we know that uniform continuity plays a rather critical role in the Babalat's lemma. Okay, so that's essentially why we care about the derivative of the signal being. L infinity. All right. Excellent. Right. So, how do we claim that? We look at the derivative itself. So, the derivative is rather straightforward in this case. It's given by this expression e2 dot is minus k1 e1 and minus k2 e2. Uh, you should remember that k1 and k2 are just some positive constants. And we've already proven in step number two that e1 and e2 are bounded. Okay. And because e1 and e2 are bounded, we have that k1 e1 and k2 e2 are also bounded. And therefore, this quantity is also bounded. So, excellent. Right? So, now if we use uh, the corollary to the Babalat's lemma, not the Babalat's lemma itself, but the corollary. Yeah, this is corollary 2.2. What did it say? It said that if a signal is L infinity and some LP, and further its derivative is L infinity, then the signal itself goes to zero as t goes to infinity. Okay. All right. So, and that's exactly what we have here. Okay, that's exactly what we have here. We have that E2 is L infinity by the fact that E2 is bounded in step 2. Right? So, this I will in fact write it for this particular case. So, this is step 2. E2 is L2 was in fact step 3. Right? We prove E2 is L2 in step 3. And the fact that the derivative is L infinity was proven in step 4. Okay. And with all these ingredients, we can invoke this corollary 2.2. Yeah, let's go back again and look at the corollary just to remind ourselves. If a function is in any L infinity and any LP, and further, if the derivative is in L infinity, then the function itself goes to zero as t goes to infinity. Okay, great. Right. So, therefore, we have proved that limit as t goes to infinity, e2 of t is exactly zero. Right? So, we have actually completed the proof of one part. Yeah? Or we have completed one part of the proof. I'm sorry. Yeah, Because we started by trying to prove that both signals E1 and E2 are going to go to 0 as t goes to infinity. And so, we have been successfully successful in proving one part of it. Okay, What does this part say in the context of of the spring mass damper, it says that your velocities yeah, converge to the desired velocity trajectories. Okay, we've already proved in 318 that the velocities converge to the desired velocity trajectories. Okay, all right. <clears throat> so moving on. So this is only one 
part of the proof, so one half of the proof. Therefore, we would like to uh, move on and try to complete the proof. Okay, and let's see how it looks. All right. So the, in the next step, we want to prove that the signal E2 dot is an integrable signal. Okay. Notice where we started. Okay. Notice where we started. This is very very critical again because these steps are rather standard. So you need to understand these steps very well. So notice where we started in step six. Until step five, we've been able to prove that e2 goes to zero. And what exactly is e2? Okay, e2 is the only quantity that shows up in v dot. Okay, so the first half of the proof essentially lets you conclude that terms appearing in v dot converge to zero Okay, so this is what we will be able to prove in the first half of the proof of, you know, first half of the sequence of steps. Yeah, that all the terms that appear in V dot, not all the terms, of course, I mean, we are doing an inequality. That, so we essentially have all quadratic terms. Well, I don't want to say quadratic. Okay, I'm sorry. I don't want to say quadratic per se, but all the terms that, you know, you have sort of in the end in v dot and you will see more examples of this so it will become clear this is merely a guideline it's not a law or a theorem okay so if you see v dot in this case it contained only e2 okay and so in the first half of the proof we are able to show that e2 goes to zero then where do we start in the second half of the proof now this is an important question okay so in step six we start exactly at the derivative of e2 okay until now we have proven that e2 goes to zero and now let's let's all recall all this myths that we spoke about yeah we know that e2 converging to zero does not necessarily mean that the derivative of e2 is going to go to a constant okay it may not even have a limit right we looked at several examples i mean uh, very you know um you know it's rather easy to construct such examples right so i mean something like for example sine t squared um let's see divided by t okay this quantity has a limit as t goes to infinity right so this is this was the example right but if i take the derivative right if i take the derivative um minus sine t square over t square plus 2 cosine t square has no limit as t goes to infinity okay so this is uh, this was sort of Yeah, this funny looking box is sort of this, uh, you know, what we proved, right? So, sign, so just the fact that a signal goes to zero does not mean that its derivative is going to converge, okay? And so this is exactly what we start to do in this next step. Yeah, we start looking at the derivative of the signals we proved are going to zero, okay? In this first half, we proved that all the ter terms appearing in v dot go to zero and now we start with the derivative of those signals okay so we prove that e2 dot e2 goes to zero so then we start with e2 dot in the next stage and this is important to remember okay um, so i'm going to write this start with derivative of converging terms from above okay 
we start here with all the converging terms from above. So the derivative of all the converging terms from above. So in this case, this is only e2 dot. Okay. So what do we show? We show that e2 dot is integrable. Why? Just integrate it. How do we conclude this? Simply by integrating it. If I take this integral right here, you see that at infinity, so this is again same idea as before. So you have this is d e2 by dt and dt. So this is just integral of d e2, which is essentially e2 at infinity minus e2 at zero. And again, why was this possible? This is possible because e2 infinity is nothing but zero. E2 infinity is the limit of E2 as t goes to infinity, and that's zero by the previous step. Okay. Otherwise, this would not have been possible. If we had not proven that the E2 had a limit as t goes to infinity, then this step would have been impossible. Okay. Excellent. Excellent. So I hope we understand that quite well. Great. So then, because we have this step, this gives me that. This uh, integral of e2 dot dt as t goes uh, 0 to infinity is just minus e2 at 0. And this is a finite integral because well, your error started at a finite value. I mean, it wouldn't make any sense otherwise. Okay. So this is a finite integral. Yeah. And therefore, this essentially helps us conclude that e2 dot is an integrable signal. Okay, e2 dot is an integrable signal. Again, we have, you should remind yourself of the Babelatz lemma and its corollary because now we are moving towards the original Babelatz lemma statement. Yeah, where we need integrability and uniform continuity. Excellent. So what do we do for uniform continuity? Because we already have integrability, right? So what do we do for uniform continuity? Evaluate the derivative, as simple as that. So we now claim that e2 double dot is an infinity right because so this will imply that e2 dot is uniformly continuous yeah because the derivative of e2 dot is bounded therefore the signal itself has to be uniformly continuous by the lemma we've seen before excellent so what do i do how do i compute e2 double dot just take the e2 dot and you know take derivatives again right so just take e2 dot here and I take the derivative again of both sides. So this gives me minus k1 e1 dot minus k2 e2 dot here. And then I substitute for e1 dot and e2 dot using the dynamics again. So this is minus k1 e2 and minus k2 times minus k1 e1 minus k2 e2. Okay. And you will notice that all these terms, again, k1 and k2 are constant. So they don't play any role in signals becoming unbounded. No question of that happening. But what remains are just states here, E1 and E2. And we've already proven in step two, in fact, long, long time ago, step two, that E1, E2 are bounded. Right? Therefore, E2 double dot also has to be bounded. Right. Even E2 is bounded. So the right hand side has just bounded quantities. So the left hand side is obviously bounded. Yeah, sum of bounded quantities or difference of bounded quantities is necessarily bounded. All right. Great. So we've essentially now shown that E2 double dot is L infinity. Okay. And this immediately tells me that E2 dot is uniformly continuous. Okay. Excellent. Now let's go back and look at the statement of the original Babelatz lemma. What does it say? It says that if a signal is integrable and it's uniformly continuous, then the signal is going to zero as t goes to infinity. Okay. So let's look at what we have. We have just shown that e2 dot is integrable and because e2 double dot is l infinity e2 dot is uniformly continuous so by the original babelatz lemma statement i can immediately conclude that e2 dot 
in fact goes to zero. Okay. All right. So I hope this sinks in well. Yeah. We started after the end of the previous half of steps with the derivative of the terms that we had proven to be going to zero, which is only e2 in this case. In a more general setup, this could be multiple signals. Yeah. E2, E3, E4, and so on and so forth. Yeah. And in the next stage, we start with the derivative of all of those. So, you know, e3 dot e4 dot e2 dot e3 dot e4 dot e5 dot so on and so forth. And we prove their integrability. We know, why do we start with this step? Because we know this is immediately possible. Yeah, because I prove that, I have proven that all of these signals go to zero as t goes to infinity. Right. Therefore, if I integrate it, it's simply going to depend on the endpoints. Yeah, and these endpoint at these endpoints that is at infinity and zero, signal is finite, and so we are done. And this is true for all signals. Yeah, or if even if you have e two, e three, e four, e five, e hundred, it doesn't matter. It will come out to be like this, as long as you have proven that these signals converge to zero. Excellent. And in the next stage, we prove that e two dot is uniformly continuous by proving by taking its derivative. And showing that it's bounded this is also very easy i can take many many derivatives further this will always be bounded yeah because you'll always get terms in e1 and e2 which are already known to be bounded okay excellent right so with this with the bablats lemma we have proven that the derivative of e2 also goes to zero right so so we've actually taken a nice formal procedure to prove that after we've proven that e2 goes to zero, we've made a nice, you know, nice formal process to prove that uh, e2 dot also goes to zero. We didn't just conclude it, you know, uh, just like that. All right. Okay. Great. So once I have e2 dot goes to zero, the rest of the proof is not difficult at all. Why is that? I immediately claim that e1 also goes to zero. So look at the expression for e2 dot. It is minus k1 e1 minus k2 e2. And here I know right, that the limit as t goes to infinity e2 dot is zero. And I know that limit as t goes to infinity e2 is zero. So what do I do? I can simply take limit. Apologize. I simply take the limit as t goes to infinity of both sides, right? And they have to match because I have, I have an equivalence here. Yeah. If I say a is equal to b, a function a of t is equal to function b of t, then the limit as t goes to infinity cannot be different, right? Therefore, if I take limits on both sides, what happens? I know that this guy is going to zero. I know that this guy is going to zero. So the only way that the left hand side can go to zero is if this quantity is also going to zero and k1 is just a positive constant. So this is possible only if e1 itself also goes to zero as t goes to infinity. Okay. All right. So this is very, very important. Right. So what have we shown? We have shown with a bunch of steps, well, nine steps to be precise. Yeah, looks like a lot of steps. But when your problem gets more complicated and you cannot resort to linear analysis, or you have an adaptive system which inherently makes your closed loop system non linear, these nine steps will look like a blessing to you. Yeah, as of now, it looks like, oh my God, I could just have computed the you know, eigenvalues and be done in a moment. But we took nine steps. But like I said, when problems become nonlinear and more complex, these nine steps will be super easy, simple, uh, significantly simple, or in fact, just possible. Okay. The other step wouldn't even be possible. Okay. Excellent. Um, so we have, as we planned, we've been able to show that uh, E1 and E2 both go to zero as t goes to infinity all right um, of course we could have 
used um, this uh, Lyapunov analysis with Lasalle invariance. We've not done this still. Yeah. In this particular case, we could also have used the analysis and LaSalle invariance. However, uh, Bablat's lemma can be used in a larger uh, scheme of things. So it's well known that uh, this, uh, this will work only for time invariant systems. Okay, work only for time invariant systems. Of course, there are modern versions which work for some some sort of time varying behavior, but they are not all encompassing. Okay, so in general, Lasalle invariance principle, which again we are yet to cover, works only for time invariant systems. So if I have something like this where my gains, yeah, instead of being constant gains, they are time varying gains. Again, something that's not uncommon in adaptive control. Then only Babalat's lemma can be applied. These cannot be applied anymore. Yeah, only Babalat's lemma can then be applied to prove convergence. Okay. So, uh, of course, this is a uh, an exercise. Yeah, you are to prove convergence of even a two to zero using the similar steps. Any additional assumptions you are free to make. And you have to, but you have to state all these assumptions and to state all these. Now, uh, I want to remind you that we only proved convergence. So we have only been, uh, we only completed the proof of convergence of these signals to origin. Okay. So we are saying something about the steady state behavior only. We are not saying anything about the transient behavior. Yeah. So remember this. Yeah. Convergence only has been proven. Stability or the fact that the trajectories remain bounded. See, one thing should be obvious to you already is that by step two here, let's see, by step two here, I mean, it's not like we have got nothing beyond convergence. We did get something more than convergence. We are also saying that uh, even an E2 remain bounded. So all the closed loop signals. So notice that our trajectories we chose were themselves bounded with bounded derivatives. All right. So what does it mean? It means that if even an E2 are bounded, then X1 and X2 are also bounded. Okay. So we do have convergence from this, but we also prove that all our closed loop signals remain bounded. Okay. So this sort of thing that you know i gave this funny sort of example this cannot happen this cannot happen yeah this cannot go to infinity and come back it can become very large and come back but everything is still bounded okay so all the closed loop trajectories are going to be bounded and on top of it you've proven convergence okay so that's sort of the good thing okay so remember that's what we have um, so we have completed the proof of how to use the Babalat's lemma to conclude asymptotic convergence of signals. Okay, stability is a separate question which we will address slightly later. All right. So what did we do today? We continued our proof of convergence of signals using the Babalat's lemma, right? Um, and we um had finished you know proving that a signal was l2 then we proved that whatever terms appearing that appear in v dot they converge to zero that's the first thing we prove then we start off our next set of steps with the derivative of those signals that we proved already go to zero and then from that we prove that these in derivatives of those signals are integrable by virtue of their convergence and then that the derivatives are um, bounded and from this we can prove that the derivatives of the signals that we proved were going to zero themselves also go to zero so if e2 goes to zero we prove that e2 dot also goes to zero okay and using the dynamics that is how the equations of e2 dot look we uh, show that even itself also goes to zero 
of course later on we will also see where uh, these things fail yeah and we get into detectability obstacles in adaptive control okay so uh, we will discuss that uh, soon All right okay so this is where we conclude today thank you for your attention